This right here is what $50 will get you and when you know the youth pastor, he'll make you one of those cool videos to let you come up here on the stage with. Thank you, Jared. Uh, Adam's going to pay you later. So, uh, But uh, how many of y'all are glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. I seen somebody smile. They saw it was a fat preacher, so they know they'll get to eat dinner a little early tonight. But uh, hey, guys, I'm so thankful to be here with you. Uh, it has been a little while since I've been in the pulpit. And uh, we've, I, one thing I'm so thankful for here at the Harbor is we have a lot of dynamic speakers. And uh, it's really kind of intimidating when you have to preach behind Pastor Sains. He's over in Nichols, Georgia tonight uh, at their first Wednesday service at the Harvest Church with Pastor uh, Javaris. So uh, please be praying for them. Pray for me right now. Uh, and uh, I just want to encourage you, though, uh, to make sure you go ahead and pull out your, your, your planner, pull out your phone. For some of you, you don't even know what you're doing tomorrow. But hey, I need you to be here next uh, November the 2nd on our first Wednesday. So Pastor Adam and the worship team is going to be, uh, they're going to be ministering at a night of worship. So I want you to be here and uh, just so thankful to uh, have this opportunity today to share the word. And uh, this word kind of got laid on my heart. I told somebody earlier today, it wasn't what I wanted to preach uh, as a pastor. You know, uh, sometimes you have a list of things that, man, you'd be like, that, that's good, man, that right there will get some amens. And then sometimes, though, you will find yourself uh, having to preach things that, man, you just really don't want to, but you know the body of God needs it. And so tonight, I want to share a message with you simply entitled, Bearing But Believing. And uh, I hope that the message tonight would encourage you in some way. Uh, but I got a question for you. I, you know, when I preach, I always try to ask you all these weird questions. But my question tonight is, um, have you ever had really good intentions, but they didn't either, you didn't either do it or they didn't work out that way? Anybody? Yeah, I, I have too. But I got a story of uh, two guys that uh, they didn't, they had great intentions, but it didn't work out. So... In Tanzania, two guys went for an interview. One was smarter than the other, but they were good friends and willing to work together so the less smarter could pass. The educated one said if, uh, he said if he went first, he could come back with the answers and uh, give, them to, give those uh, interview questions to the next guy, to his friend. And it just so happened that he got to go first that day. So he goes in. And first question on there, when was Tanzania's independence? Answer, it was supposed to be in 1960, but it was postponed in 1961 due to many reasons. Question two, who brought independence to Tanzania? Answer, so many people participated in the process, but Mawilamu Nairi uh, was the one who finalized it. Question number three, it is believed that the planet Mars has life. Is that true? Some say yes, but it's not scientifically proven. Number one guy goes out, tells number two guy the answers. He comes in, number two guy. He, uh, he says, question number one, where were you born? It was, or when were you born? It was supposed to be in 1960, but was postponed in 1961 for many reasons. Question number two, who is your mother? So many people participated in the process, but it was Mawila Nayiri who finalized it. Question number three, are you crazy? Some say, but it's uh, scientifically not proven. So the truth is, these guys had great intentions, but it didn't work out like they wanted it to. And uh, I want you to lean over to your neighbor and say, you're friend number two. Y'all, listen, I know when y'all were reading that, y'all were already thinking about who the other friend was. And don't, don't, I, I hope, I hope you didn't, didn't text them or say their name, but uh, the truth is we all had great intentions. Personally, I've had some really, really amazing intentions and maybe you can sympathize with me uh, like, hey, we're going to eat at home this week so that we can save grocery money Monday night. Where are we going to eat? You know what I'm saying? Got really good intentions. 
If somebody could ever figure out a way for us to thaw out the meat in like 30 minutes, it might work out. But you got to think about it before you leave the house, and that just don't happen. Or maybe, maybe you're like Ashley. Maybe you're like Ashley, and you have this great intention to be able to watch a movie when you're over the age of 30 after 5 p.m., You see, this is how it goes. Get your blanket. Lay down on the couch. Hold on, I got to get my coffee because we got to wa- drink a coffee before we watch a movie for some reason. Then, then five minutes, and then, hold on, then like four days of searching through Netflix to find what movie you're going to watch. Anybody else in here, you just, your whole life's just scrolling, you don't know, like, I mean, just forever. And then you finally find one that everybody agrees on. In five minutes. I mean, we didn't even get past the motion picture credits in the front. And I hear. <laughs> I, and Diesel, Diesel snores bad, real bad. He's our little dog. He snores real bad. I thought it was him. No, it's Ashley. <laughs> Ashley could never give you a review. She can give you a review about 10 minutes of the show, but she'll never be a spoiler alert for you. I promise you. And I told her the other day, I said, I said, I don't even know why you even try. It, 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 it just doesn't happen. And so uh, she said, I'm just tired. And so maybe you've had great intentions to do something. But I got a question. Any of y'all, we got any country fans in here? Like, what about 90s country? 90s country is the best country. I'm just telling you, this new stuff, I ain't feeling it. But back in, uh, back in uh, 2000, June of 2000, there was a gentleman that, uh, he wrote a song. His name's Travis Tritt. Any of y'all know Travis Tritt? You know, I, I, I wish I had that hair. I could... Just throw it around, but I don't. I ain't even going to lean my head down because I'm going bald on the top. But he came out with this song called Best of Intentions. And tonight, I'm going to sing it for you. Y'all see, y'all see what I did there? I had the best of intentions of playing it for you, and no lie, this is, this is the truth. This morning, I came in, and Pastor Jared was in the office. I was like, hey, I got this great idea. I want to be able to play the intro to this song called The Best of Intentions. And he looked at me, and I was like, we can do this, right? And he's like, yeah, uh-huh. He didn't even know it, but after about 20 minutes of me, my, I got sausage fingers, so I can't even, like, I told him, I was like, this ain't even going to happen. So then we came up with this great idea, we'd just play it for you. But, you know, the thing is, I had, I had the best of intentions of playing it for you today, but I, I can't. That's, uh, maybe if I'd have started a year ago. But uh, the truth of the matter is that in Travis's Tritt's song, he tells us the story of how he had this great intention to, to do amazing things for his wife. But his best intentions never worked out. He started... He started failing in his career. He started failing in the promises and the intentions that he had promised to his wife. And in that song, he says this line. He says, but my best laid plan slipped right through my hands. And I don't know about you, but I can feel a little bit of what Travis Tritt was singing. But the thing of that, of that song, what's so great if you watch it or watch the video, is that though the world from the outside thought he was a loser and though he had messed up and he had had great intentions, but he ultimately failed, the truth of the matter was his wife never lost hope in him. And maybe, maybe I think we could see through the lens that that's what Jesus does for us, that even on our worst day, He still loves us. Even on our worst day, no matter how bad we've messed up, no matter how bad we've missed it, 
He still loves us. And I'm so thankful for that. Because if I asked you in here today, we all have great godly intentions. We all, if, if I came down here on the front row and I said, Antoine, what would you want to do? Antoine would say, man, I want to love Jesus Christ and I want to love people. And I want to make a kingdom difference. And the thing is, I think all of us want great things. We want to be a great Christian. We want to be the friend that people come to in the middle of a crisis. We, we want to be a, a person that, that our pastor can depend upon in time of need. We, we want to be the Christian that goes to the Word of God daily and reads it so that when life punches us in the mouth, we don't have to, we don't have to run to everything out there, but we can run to the cross. But I know this, intentions don't always equal actions. Intentions do not always equal actions. And I think in our life that we want those things, but something stops us. Something prevents us from being what we know we should be for Jesus Christ. So tonight's message is for every single person in this room that calls himself a Christian. Regardless if you're 11 or if you're 99, today it's a call to action. Today this sermon, like I said, it wasn't what I wanted to preach, but I believe it's a message to every single one of us that God's given us a second chance and we need to do something with it. So, I'd love for you to grab your Bible. If you don't have one that has pages and ages, we're going to throw one up here on the screen for you. And so as you're, as you're making your way, I want you to flip over to the Luke, the 13th chapter. We're going to start at verse 6. And we're going to read to verse 35. I'm just joking. I don't like to be read to, so we're only going to go to verse 9. You know, you want to put me to sleep, just read to me. Matter of fact, when I can't sleep, I just turn the Bible on. App, and, I, and I woke up the other day, I was almost at the book of Revelations. <laughs> I think Ashley's woke up and turned it off before. Cause, but listen, I want to share this with you today, and I want to I unpack uh, this passage. So if you got your Bible, uh, let, let's for the uh, reading and respect of the Lord, let's just stand real quick if y'all don't mind. All right, let's do this. Luke, 6, or Luke 13, verse 6, it says, Then Jesus told his story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It just take up space in this garden. The gardener answered, Sir, Give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. In verse 9, if we get figs next year, fine, and if not, you can cut it down. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight to share this word. God, that you impressed upon my heart. God, even when I tried to, to get away from it, God, I couldn't. But God, I believe right here under the sound of my voice, God, there's people, God, that need to hear this word tonight. They need to heed this word. God, they, they need to not only just let it be something that it comes into their heart, but God, to let it change their heart. And God, I pray that you would touch this time that we have. I pray you would remove distractions. God, I pray we'd focus on you for just the next few minutes, God, and hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And you're more than welcome to be seated. So tonight, if we're ever going to fulfill God's plans and destiny to be fruitful, we will have to embrace three realities today. And so if you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. The first reality is that God planted you with a purpose. God planted you with a purpose. You see, you were created on purpose for a purpose. As a, as a pastor, one of the things that I, 
pretty much on a regular. People either come to H Track or I talk to them in a life group or I'm in church. The one thing they ask me, they say, Pastor Josh, I want to know my purpose. I want to know why I'm here. I want to know why God created me. And listen, we, I, we are in the middle of an identity and a purpose crisis in our world. And I'm not going to go down that road, but what I'm just telling you is the world is searching for purpose. They're searching for why was I made? Why did God put me on earth? Did God just put me on earth so that bad things could happen to me? Did God just put me on earth so that I could just go to work, get a paycheck, and never fully, fully get ahead? And so I want you to understand that, that the answer today is, is simple, but it's complex. You ever, you ever ran into that where, where something seemed simple, but it was complex? It was like that guitar today. I thought it was going to be easy. I thought I could learn it in like 10 minutes. I mean, I didn't even want to play a song. I just wanted to play like three notes. But listen, our purpose is simple, but complex. And I want to unpack it for you tonight. You see, this, if you, if you, I, want you to, I want you to see this. And it comes out of John chapter 15, verse 16. It says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have appointed you. And I have placed you. And I have purposefully planted you so that you would go and bear fruit and keep on bearing. That your fruit will remain and be lasting so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, as my representative, he may give to you. You see today, God's plan for us, our purpose is simple. It is to be fruitful. God called us to be fruitful. And that seems simple. That's, that's the answer you come looking for today. I, I'm here. There you go. Y'all have a great night. No, it's not that simple though. You see, the complexity comes in in Luke chapter 13. Verse 1 through 5, and we didn't read it, but I want to paraphrase it for you. Luke, 1, Luke 13, 1 through 5 says this. It tells the story, and it's kind of weird. But it talks about how Pilate had killed these people that had come to the temple to, 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 do, to give their sacrifices. But he killed them. And then Jesus tells this other story about how this tower fell down, and 18 people died because of this tower. And, and I kind of was like, why is this before this fig tree? And this is what Jesus says in, in Luke 13, 4 and 5. It says, Jesus says, were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? Verse 5, no. I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. You see, Jesus is telling us in this parable about the fig tree, and I believe it's so true now, is that Jesus is showing us that unless we repent and produce godly fruit, we likewise will perish like those in, one, in chapter 1 and verse 5, or chapter verse 1 through 5. Because this is the complexity. This is, what I, this is what's tough to preach. True Fruitfulness begins with a genuine repentance. You see, we, we, like, we like cheap grace. We like just come to church, give when you want to, show up when you want to, and at the end of your life, you're going to stand before God, and he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But that is not what the Word of God tells us. True repentance will cost us something. True repentance is more than just good intentions. True repentance, if you go and look at the Hebrew word, it's called metanoia, which means to change direction. So think, let's think about this. We're all in a car and we're going down the road and we see, we see a sign that says metanoia. It would really be a U-turn. And so for us, we cannot just go through life thinking, oh, yep, I sinned yesterday. Dear Lord, please forgive me. And then you go back and you do the same thing today and you do the same thing tomorrow and the same thing the next day. But hey, man, I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me. That is not repentance. It is insanity. 
And the truth of the matter is, we are barren so many times because true repentance has not found its place in our heart. Repentance takes action. You have to stay connected to the vine. If you're going to be fruitful and do the purpose that God called us to do, you will have to stay connected to the vine. John 15, 5 and 6 says this, Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. And those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like useless branches and withers. And such branches are gathered up and thrown into a pile to be burned. I've come today to tell you this. You cannot, you cannot fall in love with the vineyard and not the vine. What you mean, Pastor Josh? If we're not careful, we come into this church, man, and we fall in love with every ministry, and we fall in love with the people, and we fall in love with the program, and we fall in love with the people, but at some point, we have to fall passionately in love with Jesus Christ, because this place is going to go away, and these people are going to go away, and I'm scared. I'm honestly scared that we are raising up a generation of people that feel like just because they come to church and because they sit in a pew that they're going to make it to heaven. That is not what the Word of God says to us. And so if we're not careful, we'll fall in love with, with the vineyard and stop, stop loving the vine. You know why? Because the vine, it, it, it's tough sometimes. It's not easy to get up and read the Word of God. It's not easy to show up and be faithful in church. It's not easy to always come and serve. It's not always easy to fast. It's not always easy to pray. And so we find ourselves wanting this fruit. Those intentions, man, we want it, but we're not willing to give up the actions. And you see, this is what I know about those that have fell in love with the vineyard and not the vine. And this is it. They, from a distance, they look like they're doing good, but they have no fruit. You see, it's easy to get caught up in a vineyard and look good. Look like the rest of the trees. What I, what I, in my research, what I found out was the fig tree is really good about hiding the fruit under the leaves. So it wasn't until you got really close to it that you could see the fruit. And so some of us in here, and God convicted me really hard, so let me just say I'm preaching to, with you, not to you. And this was what it was, that, that sometimes we can look good on the outside, but there be no fruit on the inside of our trees. But not only do we have to stay connected to the vine, but we have to seek godly fruit over the things of this world. You see, it's so easy to fill our trees uh, with, with wrongful fruit. You know, this is an apple tree, and this is an apple. And the truth is, we would want our apple tree to produce more apples. But I'm fearful that we have a bunch of Christians that are producing non-Christians. I've got a fear that we've got a lot of people that love Jesus Christ, but the, but the fruit that they're bearing doesn't represent it. And if we're not careful, we, we, we begin to put our focus on all the wrong fruit. If, if I took a permanent marker and I wrote on this today, it, it, would, be, it would be like me saying things like, acquiring the best of material things. You know, my daughter, she's, uh, she's eight, she's nine. Man, I'm getting old. Uh, she's nine. And so the other day when we were on vacation, she was like, hey, Dad, uh, can you buy me a pair of uh, Jordans? And I was like, what, what? I didn't even know how much a pair of Jordans cost. So walking through the mall, and we go into the store, and I, I, I pull up these Jordans, and I say, honey, you better talk to Jesus. <laughs> this thing, I said, 
I seen the way you care for that room. I, you ain't about to, I ain't paying this money. I'm talking like, like $200, man. Yeah, a nine-year-old kid. That's what happens when they watch YouTube. Stop them watching YouTube. You know? I mean, I used to walk around, I used to walk around with, you know, the, the, the ones that you didn't, you was trying to hide them, you know? Yeah, the bobos, you know? But the thing is, and, and listen, I want you to get this because please don't think I'm preaching against nice things. What I'm preaching on is when that is the only thing that is in our focus, when it's only about those things. When we say, I'm going to go do that, but I'm not going to pray today. I'm going to go do that, but I'm not going to come to the house of God today. You see, the thing is, is if we're not careful, we see success completely different than God sees it. You see, or, or, or maybe it's our social media influence. I got it. Man, y'all look amazing down here, this, this up front crew. Y'all look awesome. Now, yeah. So I'm going to preach to y'all for just a few seconds. Listen, some of you live to make sure your social media is the best thing going. Now, a bunch of these old people, they're still on Facebook. We know you're not there. That's cool. And I'm not going to chase you. If you see my Instagram post, do me a favor, like it for me. It'll help me out. But the thing is, if we're not careful, we go seeking and we put all of our energy into what this world on the outside is looking for. And we stop asking ourselves, do I really look like I'm supposed to to God? Because we find ourselves, listen, it's easy to make yourself look good on social media. If you, if, you don't need, if you need help, they got five apps. They'll help you down here. We got the brush tool. We can take all your wrinkles away. You know, uh, we, 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 we got 27,000 different filters. The thing is, if we're not careful, we get so focused on the wrong things. Maybe it's our status. Maybe it's our success. But the question that I have tonight that God asked me, but are we truly, are we producing fruit that will last beyond the grave? These things are going to pass away. Man, I, I, I want a new truck so bad. I was just telling somebody for a service. I wish they'd get the road fixed on Highway 40. I got an old Dodge truck. Every time I hit those bumps, I almost bust my teeth out. You know, so I was riding with Pastor the other day. He's got a nice GMC. It was like we never even hit him. I was like, I need this, you know. But the thing is, and, and the truth is, that, that if we're not careful, if we're not careful, that becomes our focus. And, and, and trucks are great, and houses are great, and buying your kids nice clothes are great, and all those things are wonderful. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, they're all going to go away. And my dad used to say this, and I used to hate it. He said, in 100 years, will it matter? And that's what we need to start asking ourselves. The only thing that matters in 100 years is what we do for eternity, not for what we do right here. You see, the question I want to ask you today is, are we producing fruits of the Spirit? Are we producing love and joy? Or do people run away from you when they see you coming? You want to know if you're just a, a good Christian? If people don't like being around you, you may want to check how much you love Jesus Christ. What about patience? Now, this is the smallest fruit on my tree, so don't even, we ain't even going there. I ain't even going to be a hypocrite and preach against, you know, so. But patience, Lord knows. Uh, Self-control, faithfulness, and now there's nine of them, and I'm not going to go through all of them. But what I'm asking you, parents, moms, dads, grandparents, inside of everyone, if I cracked open this apple, inside there's seeds, and those seeds are going to be passed down and they're going to be planted. And the question is, are we, are we planting seeds that be successful on your job but fail at home? Are we passing down seeds that says, be, be amazing on the ball field but not in personal devotion? Or, or, or what are we passing down to, to the next generation? I told Ashley the other day, I don't want my children to fall in love with Jesus. I mean, fall in love with the church and fail to fall in love with Jesus. 
And you know whose responsibility it is? That's mine. That's not Jordan's. That's not Jared's. That's not Pastor Adam. That's not Pastor Mike. That is my responsibility that they see Jesus Christ high and lifted up and that they know well, who he is and what he can do in their life. You see, today, not only were you planted for a purpose, the second reality is He's a God of second chances. He's a God of second chances. I hate more than anything to disappoint someone. I, I'm one of those people that I'm an overthinker. And so like if I disappoint you, when I leave you, I think about all the disappointment and I think about how I could have fixed it and how I could have made it better. But at the end of the day, I know this, that I have disappointed Jesus Christ. That even on my best day, I've messed up. And many of you probably have too. But you see, yes, he's, the point, he's disappointed, but he's not done with you. If you're looking right in the middle of this passage, it honestly feels like the second reality that I'm talking about is a total lie. Because in the bottom part of chapter se verse 7, it says, cut it down. And so it doesn't make sense that how can he be a God of second chances when he's saying cut it down? Because listen, if you go a little bit further, if you go a little bit further, it says this, the gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it, another, leave it alone another year. And I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. And I want you to know that when Jesus shows up on the scene, he changes everything. And maybe, maybe I didn't unpack this like I should have. I want you to understand in this story that simply the tree represents us, the gardener represents Jesus, and the vine owner represents God. And God sometimes, he, he's done. But guess what? Guess what I found out? I found out that when Jesus Christ died on a cross, hung for our sins on the third day, got up and rose again and ascended to heaven, you know what he said? He said, I'm going to the right hand of the Father to be the intercessor for you. So guess what? When you're down and you're out, guess what? You got somebody praying for you. And it ain't Pastor Adam. It ain't Pastor Josh. It is Jesus Christ himself. You see, God's not finished with you. I don't care how much the enemy's lied to you. There's grace and there's mercy even when our best intentions fall short. But Jesus said something in here. He said, I believe, he didn't say this, but this is what his actions said. He said, I believe that tree can make it. I believe that tree can make it. And now, the passage we read today said, give it special treatment and fertilize it. But the other version said, let me dig around it and let me, let me dung it. And I believe when Jesus got to that tree that day and he's looking at it and he knows for three years there's not been any fruit. I believe the tree had great intentions and great potential, but it didn't produce. And Jesus gets there and he says, I believe there's a chance. I believe that with some special attention, we can turn this thing around. Yeah. And I think he got down with his shovel and he began to dig Because this is what he understood. It wasn't a fruit problem. It was a root problem. We don't, we don't produce fruit because of a root problem. And I believe Jesus Christ is showing up here tonight. And, and just like this old tree, 
I believe Jesus wants to deal with some root problems here tonight. I believe that I believe he wants to dig around. You, you know what you do with the shovel? You, you begin to cut off by roots that don't need to be there. Some of you, you got, you got root problems that need to be cut out like bitterness. You're so angry and upset by what happened to you. But you never move forward. And you come to church and you're in the vineyard with people that are doing great and they're flourishing and you're like, man, I want that. But you won't deal with the root of bitterness. Some of you, man, it's a root of fear. You know, pastor preached an awesome service on Sunday uh, talking about finish what you started. And you know what gripped my heart as soon as he began to speak? That fear. Fear. The enemy began to whisper in my ear. As soon as God was saying something on this side, fear was saying something on this side. And so fruit just doesn't grow. Some of you, man, you've got a, you've got a root problem with sexual lust. You, you, can't, you can't seem to go one day without those sexual desires just messing your life up. You're looking at things on your phone you shouldn't be. You're hiding things from people. And all the while, man, you, you're barren. And you're believing it'll change, but you won't do nothing with the root of the problem. I told you I didn't want to preach this message. I knew it was hard. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe you just, you, somebody gets blessed around you. You get so mad. You ask God why. You've been tithing. You've been showing up to church. Why? It's bitter. Or maybe, maybe it's the root of busyness and wrong priorities. Man, you, you look at people in the church and you're like, man, I wish, I wish I could be that devoted. I wish I could give that much time. But we, we're finding all these different things and God's saying, hey, cut it out. Cut it out. What Jesus understood that day was that if this tree's ever going to make it, i got to dig around it. I know in some, some places it's hard and some places that God's message, just like today, some, I'm preaching my heart out and some of you are thinking about things that are completely not even close to this message and you're pushing back the Word of God. Some of you, you just want to get out of here and get home. And God is saying, if you just listen to me, if you just listen to me, I want to change your life. I know without a shadow of a doubt somebody came here tonight and this is what God spoke to me a week ago and I couldn't I, I, anybody can tell you Ashley can tell you I didn't want to preach it but somebody came here somebody God spoke this to me a week ago and he said this he said Josh there will be somebody in the house that you've had a season of producing but because of the root issues you had you're about ready to hang it up. And I don't know who you are. But today, as I walked around this parking lot, I said, God, I don't care if it's just for one. God, I pray that you would soften their heart. But not only did Jesus dig around it, it said he dug it. Which means, simply means if, you, if you're young with us, young kids with us, <laughs> that's animal poop. What, what you mean? What you mean? If God's going to, if you're going to get at a place that you're producing fruit, my friend, you're going to have to go through some tough situations. You're going to have to go through some places that stink. And I'm fearful that some of you have been in a place that stinks so long. You're about ready to give up. 
you're about ready to quit. But if we could talk to Job, he would tell you, hold on. He would tell you, I lost everything. I lost my children. I lost every wealth I had. But hold on. Because what what you're going, the mess, is going to be a message. Remember this. I don't know who I'm speaking to. Remember this. That your most productive times will not always be the prettiest times. There'll be times that you want to quit, you want to walk away. But I'm telling you this. If we could listen to to, to Joseph, Joseph would say, I had a dream. They threw me in a pit. I got stuck in prison. And what we don't realize is it was 22 years. We read it like it was two days. 22 years. But what we see on the other side is he saved an entire world. That when famine was coming and taking over the whole place, God had given him a place that he could restore and that he could help not only his people, but other people and other generations. And other... And if we could talk to Paul, Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was left on, left to be beaten, put in prisons. But Philippians 3 8 says this Furthermore, I count all things to, to be but lost for the excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have served the lost, and of all things, and count them but as dung that I may gain Christ. If you look at the mess you're going through as the thing that'll take you out instead of the thing that'll take you up, my friend, you are going to lose out. You're going to lose out. As you stand in here tonight. God's not through with you. I believe many of you in here, you're barren, but you're believing God sent me today just to share this word. A word that was tough, but a word I believe we needed to hear. But the last and final reality that we have is this. That if we, verse 9 says this, if we get figs next year, fine. And if not, then cut it down third and final reality is now is the time. Now, the time is now. Not next year. Not when life slows down. Not when I'm in high school. Not when I get to college. Not when not when I get the right job or I marry the right person. Now, now, what you mean? You talked about a second chance. Don't always count on it. Jesus says right there that in one year when you come back, if there ain't no figs on this tree and there ain't no fruit on this tree, then God have your way and cut it down. I know that goes against our, that goes against grace and mercy of what we just taught. But what I'm telling you this is that I will stand before God in the messages that I preach. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed next week, next year. But I can tell you this, every single day, people are dying and going to hell. So we don't have time to sit on our hands and to get upset about where we're at in life. But what we do have is a mandate from God that says, be faithful, be fruitful. And as you're in here tonight, I want to simply, with head bowed and eyes closed, I preach my heart. I feel like God wants to do something significant. I I don't want it just to be another altar call that you walk down and and listen. I know the the only the only barometer to an altar call is time. But I want this to be. If you're coming tonight, I want us to be real. I want. I know God wants to. God's got you here for a purpose. You didn't come on a Wednesday night when the, 
when it was when it was the executive pastor preaching for no reason. God's got you here. And God's got a second chance for you. But I believe that this message is more about what we want to do and what we're going to do. We're going to do what God's called us to do. And I don't care what you're going through. He is going to be with you. Jesus said, I'm going to show him special attention. I'm going to dig around him. And guess what? Digging around, and, and, and this was the picture that I seen, that Jesus got down there with his hands, and he dug down deep, and he wants to get right in your mess. And so if you're here tonight, and you need God to get into your mess, to get into your situation, to turn some things around, I simply want to ask you this. When I count to three, I want you to step out of your seat, and I want you to come to this altar. If you're here, one, two, three. If this message was for you tonight, I want you to come. But please know this is a more about what we're going to do and not what we want to do. Come on. Come on. If you feel God pulling on your heart, come on. Don't hold back. Listen, we've all, this message ministered to the core of who I am as a Christian. Because sometimes it's easy to be in church and not producing fruit. So if you're here. Pastor Adam begins to sing. I want to ask some of our leaders, some of you that you know where you're at with Jesus Christ, that you know that you've been in a place of producing and you're coming in today. We're just coming in to be the hands and feet of Jesus.